On to, so Farming for Nature was set up to inspire and encourage farmers that farm or wish to farm more with nature in mind. One of the ways we do this is each year we find exemplary farmers and uh, who are extraordinary spokespersons for nature. And these are our Farming for Nature ambassadors. And we're every Monday night, we have the honor of speaking to one of these ambassadors and finding out their tried and tested methods of how they farm alongside nature. So the, uh, over the next hour, myself and Brendan will kickstart the event with asking some um, questions to our guest speaker. And then we invite you, the participants, to write into the chat box um, any questions that you may have around the guest speaker's farming practices for nature uh, and the methods that he may use or she may use. So, and if you um, have to sign out at any stage or you miss part of this, uh, the session will be up on YouTube by tomorrow afternoon. So feel free to spread the word uh, from our YouTube channel and uh, uh, revisit it then if you missed anything from tonight's session. So on to tonight's speaker. Um, we're delighted to welcome Patrick Frankel with us. Patrick is a uh, organic farmer based in Donnerail in County Cork. He farms 145 acres with his wife Judith and their young children. Um, his farm is largely focused around horticulture, but he also has uh, beef, uh, shorthorn cattle, which he sells at 30 months. And his horticulture, he sells in normal times to about 26 different cafes and restaurants around Cork City, as well as markets. Patrick has a background and a very strong interest also in soil fertility. So Patrick, thank you for joining us tonight. We're delighted to have you. And um, hopefully our, um, our technical issues have stopped here. Um, Patrick, you might just start with your own hmm. journey into agriculture. How did it start? How did you find yourself where you are now? Uh, good question, which I, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, you know, I, I found myself where I am now by accident, really. Um, I, I was training in science in, in Dublin in Trinity, and I was a research embryologist. Uh, and I took um, a bit of time out after a master's and there was apples ripening on the trees and I decided I'd have a go at selling apples. And I joined the farmer's market through Caroline Robinson in the Coquille. She gave me a, a pitch and that was the start of it. I always worked on the farm, but it was only until I, uh, you know, I guess spend time thinking about farming as a career as opposed to helping out my dad that I, uh, I got involved in it. Uh, and we were at the time at Heavy Horses here. And uh, there was a guy called Jim Cronin, who is now an ambassador for Farming for Nature. And he was running a course uh, in organic horticulture for commercial uses. And I got involved in that. Uh, and after completing Jim's course, I, I started trading and selling and, and expanded the vegetable enterprise. So that's how it all started. Brilliant. Apples. Excellent, apples. <laughs> Excellent. And you might just, um, for those of us who, you know, for those of us who haven't seen your farm, um, maybe take us through your farming system and from season to season, what it looks like and, you know, how you farm and your land type. Okay. Well, um, I'm lucky where I'm growing vegetables and where we have grassland because it's a south facing farm. It's got loamy, sandy soil, so good drainage, good fertility. Uh, and our season for vegetables in normal years was uh, we only took one year out. So we grow and supply vegetables uh, all the rest of the years to a farmer's market and to restaurants. Uh, and that was um, sort of helped a lot by putting up more polytunnels and uh, extending seasons on either end and choosing crops, things like kale and leeks and storing potatoes in the ground. We were able to keep, keep produce going. Uh, the system was, is really heavily dependent on uh, volunteer labor through the woofing scheme. That's how I was able to, to operate essentially. Uh, so during this lockdown and last year, it's been quite difficult operating with my type of system uh, without the volunteers coming through. Uh, we have about 90 acres of grassland for the cattle uh, and there's 30 acres, which are, uh, essentially a nature reserve on the farm. There's a river running through this farm and the land 
by the riverbanks is, is shut off and um, the surrounding area also. Uh, and there's little pockets of forest throughout the farm. Uh, yeah, month to month, really, it, it's, it's a system that keeps, you know, income coming in is one of its strong points. Uh, the downside is there's little downtime. Uh, so now that I've hit my 40th year, I'm wondering, you know, how clever am I really? <laughs> but it's been, um, yeah, it's been a really, the journey up to this point has been amazing because it's such an accessible type of work farming and people can join in. Uh, you don't need to be that skilled essentially to be really like playing a big positive impact on this farm. And I've, I've benefited hugely from people coming through and from getting so many ideas through the people. They've come to learn, but they've been teaching me along the way also. I mean, it sounds like an amazing, I mean, obviously the last year has been a strange year, like you said, but I know when I originally spoke to you, you said that you could have up to 50 foot woofers a year on your farm. So, I mean, that's an extraordinary community that you've built up. So you obviously have a keen interest in developing education yourself and having that kind of peer to peer learning. Is that important to you and, and, and what you do on the farm? Yeah, I think especially um, when I started out, it was there was such a synergism, but there was also young people coming through who were enthusiastic, who were thinking of doing something similar. Uh, and I was building it from scratch and we weren't mechanized. We're not particularly mechanized now, to be honest. Uh, so I, I needed help uh, and not particularly efficient either starting out. So you can imagine things like putting manure out over a few acres and things like that with no machinery it was it's, when I look back on it it was all a bit like yeah inefficient I guess but a big learning curve and yeah I, I did enjoy showing people you know how to grow vegetables also how to sell vegetables and be part of the farm in general because it's a nice place to come for people uh, we don't have great internet in most parts of this farm as well. And I always found that was an interesting social experiment to see what they'd be up to in the evenings when the phone line would just collapse in the forest somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and I think, yeah, it has been important to me up to this point and being great for my kids who grew up with lots of people around. And, uh, you know, it, it was social actually. And a lot of farming nowadays can be quite alienating uh, and you, you can end up from one day to the next not seeing anybody outside of a lockdown, you know, if you don't get off the farm. So this work, when you're growing vegetables and meeting orders almost three or four days a week, you could be delivering, you know. It's nice to have people around and helping because uh, it is quite a tough, it's a tough whole game, I find, uh, if you're on your own. Yeah, fair enough. And tell me, um, you know, you have your polytunnels, you've, you've mentioned the orchard, you also have shorthorn cattle. So how integral are they to your kind of farming system? Or, you know, what's your, what's your, what do you do with your shorthorns? Well, uh, they're, they're really important, uh, the shorthorn cattle. They, they've got a great temperament, which I've, we've had different breeds here. And I've been, you know, never more relaxed around cattle than shorthorn. Uh, I find they're just, they're not, uh, they're not nervy, essentially. They don't seem to have that in them. Uh, and they're nice to see it. And they can be all colors too. So a feel for the shorthorns, you would, if you didn't know, you'd think there could be four or five different breeds in it, mm -hmm. even, but they're not, they can be from white to brown and anything in between. Uh, and our far, the way we use the shorthorn uh, is we fatten them on grass. Uh, so there's no feeding outside of that. And we make, haylage, which is a bit like silage, just dried for a few days before being baled. Mm -hmm. uh, and all the cattle come in from December until March, and we put them in old cattle sheds on straw, and all that farmyard manure is our fertility bank, essentially. So without those cattle in, we wouldn't generate between 80 to 100 tons of farmyard manure. Uh, and that's taken out and composted and used in the vegetable enterprise. Uh, probably a year after being removed from the shed and we turn it uh, four or five times. So we have long windrows of compost and would mix into that foliage and dead material from the tunnels or surrounds and leaves from our avenue and things. Uh, so they're crucial for our fertility because I think it's, 
it's important when you're farming to understand what you have accessible to you as opposed to probably fall in with marketing and start buying in things mm -hmm. uh, when you might not need them, you know? And with organic farming, often you see that and you realize you don't need sprays if, if you have different crop spacings or different cultivars. Uh, you know, you can improve your own fertility, obviously, if you have your own cattle. Uh, I'm not saying we close the gate and we can do it all here on our own, but certainly there are certain things now that we're not dependent on outside supply and the cattle would be crucial for that. So you mentioned, so you're organic obviously, and you mentioned that you use compost on your, to kind of enhance your soil fertility. Is there any other system of green manures or cover crops or anything that you also use um, around your beds and in your fields? Certainly, yeah, I think, um, uh, last year we didn't actually em employ green manures, but up to that point every year uh, we had any area that was harvested after the summer uh, got cereal rye and that was a stand for the winter to keep the soil covered and keep things growing. Uh, and that was overwintered and then discarded back in in the spring. Uh, if crops come out earlier and we're not using it, we often use buckwheat or phacelia. These are the seeds that um, germinate and grow very fast. It's, it says on the back of the packet, place in the ground and stand back because they <laughs> just come up at you. Uh, and, you know, there could be a seven week turnaround. You just put it in. It's phenomenal. The, the growth rate of, of green manures such as that, uh, they'll die back in the winter anyway. They're not frost hardy. Uh, sometimes with those green manures, we've experimented with saving the seed for the next year or in terms of buckwheat, saving it as a grain and germinating it uh, even to eat as a sprout, you know, or for the chickens and things. So green manures sometimes have little patches that are let go on. Uh, in longer term areas, uh, yeah, a few years ago, I put in uh, clovers to leave in for two years as well. Uh, so those green manures are probably, yeah, I think those four are the ones I've used consistently. And it really has a strong impact in suppressing uh, weed growth the following year I find if mm -hmm. you can crowd it out it's, it's actually what's going on I always imagine it's sort of a three-dimensional view into the soil and see the roots of the green manures interacting with the roots of weeds and competing as much as covering out you know sunlight from their foliage uh, and you know some of them can uh, secrete uh, chemical compounds that can have an effect to inhibit the growth of, of the weeds roots and suppress them as well. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really useful way of maintaining the soil in good heart. If you have time to leave it, you know, for, for let's say seven weeks is a buckwheat stand, eight weeks uh, or phacelia. And yeah, if you can cover your ground over winter anyway, you're, you're doing a good thing, I find. There's no point leaving ground bare or brown. You're just encouraging, you know, it to leach out. I noticed uh, it, there's a lovely video of Patrick's farm. If anyone hasn't seen it, it's on our YouTube channel. It's, it's about five minutes long. Uh, but what's really lovely about your farm, Patrick, is, is the colours. Like, you know, I know it sounds really daft, but, you know, when people are vegetable growing, they kind of think, oh, there's a lot of green there. But actually, you leave these strips of calendula and trickery and, you know, you've got these lovely colours, but I cannot, you know, from speaking to you tonight, I know you're a scientist and there's a method behind the madness as to why you do this. You might just explain for people what, why is it you kind of have these pollinator strips maybe around your crops, uh, your horticultural crops and, you know, it, the importance of that and, or is there an importance or is it just purely for aesthetics? Well, aesthetics, funnily enough, matters because you show up every day and I think it is uplifting if, if it's not essentially all business, you know, uh, because when you're planting up to sell, uh, there, a bit of the romance can go out of it after picking salad, you know, for six or seven hours or the spacings are tight and you're trying to maximize a lot of the soil, which is it's logical because uh, the margins can be quite tight. Uh, so I do feel it is actually having a positive function on everyone around it. Uh, but a lot of these uh, strips do provide uh, habitats. You know, you'll see a lot of 
hoverflies. You'll see a lot of predators for aphids uh, and green fly living in these strips too. Uh, you'll see a lot of bee action. You know, there'll be essentially a hum in the strip that you might not see either side of it where all the vegetables are growing. Uh, yeah, we, we tend to, um, to put these strips in between our vegetable patches uh, and every year I'd like to grow more, to be honest. Sometimes in the tunnel, I'll have any corner that I can't really utilize well for vegetable production. I just get uh, calendula in there or nasturtiums or something like that. Cornflower, uh, I find along with calendula have a function as a edible flower that's quite popular uh, for restaurant sales too. So it, it actually does have a, a sort of, you know, a harvesting value. quality for us. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it is hard work selling it unless you're connected with restaurants that are interested in that type of thing. But once there's, you find the market, it, it has a positive uh, thing. Yeah, I think, I think they're an all rounder really. They keep in, insect life going. Like in around our vegetable plot, we put in a hawthorn hedge. Uh, again, it's flowers, it's green, it breaks the wind, uh, but the amount of life that you see either flying in and out of it, you know, through bird activity, or when in this winter time, you can see all the nests in it now. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't cut that hedge, we just let it blossom and it's flourishing. And, you know, it doesn't need to be, have a flat top and sides for us, and mm -hmm. it's thickening out. Uh, and, you know, it's almost like it's a magnitude more from the input of effort I put in to plant that hedge to what it's giving back now. Mm -hmm. uh, and those birds are nipping around, you know, they'll be eating insects too. Uh, we don't seem to have any trouble with birds in our tunnels with the soft fruiting vegetables at all. So it's not a deterrent for me or to advise people to encourage birds in. The only place I'd watch out for birds with us is with the seeds. Uh, they'll get at the seed trays. So we cover them with a fleece or a bayonet, something like that, mm -hmm. uh, until they're, you know, up about an inch and a half. Uh, but yeah, I think incorporating diversity in general, if it's flowers, you know, in strips or between tunnels, if it's hedges, you're, you're essentially building a more robust system, I mm -hmm. find. Uh, you know, there's still have plenty of room uh, to grow. It's not imp impacting on light or anything. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And Patrick, there's kind of a lot of terms floating around at the moment, like regenerative, biological farming, holistic management. Do you find you kind of associate yourself with any of them in particular, or are you, or do you just kind of pick up bits and bobs out of each, or do, do any kind of really resonate with you, and why? Uh, I think, yeah, I'd pick and choose. You know, I'm, I was really influenced last year by a guy called Kieran Clune, who came to the farm and he was interested in no-dig practices on a quite a big scale, you know, he was thinking of a few acres uh, and we started incorporating that philosophy in the tunnels. And up to that point, I had, we had some no-dig patches, but nothing, you know, to that level. Uh, if I read an idea, whatever it is, and it interests me, I think I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd consider it. Uh, so I'd be picking and choosing. Uh, we're generally, you know, I'd label this farm just as an organic farm. Uh, it has quite a diverse sort of skill set or, you know, we, we can offer a range of products here. So we have our cattle, we used to sell beef, now we sell the animals once they're fattened. Uh, we can produce apple juice, lots of different soft fruits, uh, as well as pears and figs, and then we have about 25 types of vegetables and herbs. Uh, and I'll try and grow those things in any way I can, really, you know. Uh, what I'm noticing more and more is uh, the weed problems I'm getting primarily is chickweed. And, and I'm turning up those seeds uh, when I rotivate. Uh, and when Kieran was here, uh, he did a, a full tunnel top dress that would mulch, you know, compost the material, well rotted, spread it out, broke it down. And it was pretty obvious where we were going. It's been very little weeding and less watering in that tunnel. Mm. So I think, yeah, that was an eye opener to how can you do that over a few acres that you, without being hugely mechanized? It's a challenge. Uh, yeah, but holistic, regenerative, anything I think that's taking into account more and more the soil biology and like 
the sharing is that nature is a sharing game and humans don't like to share. We like to sort of get our stuff and keep everything else away. Uh, but there's a price to be paid for that eventually. Uh, yeah, and I'm learning that more and more and seeing the benefits of, um, yeah, of, of applying practices that aren't necessarily totally conventional. Uh, and just this um, winter, we've put out about half an acre of uh, compost on the ground and we've just covered the whole thing with uh, like a sheet of silage wrap I mean silage cover like a huge plastic sheet and we've done another area with cardboard and mulch that with an inch so like these are massive areas for us where I normally would have a green manure in there but now they're going to be potential no dig sites and see how it goes uh, and I think yeah for me the biggest challenge has been weed control that's the you know, it's a, an impressive plant, chickweed, and if you get it, you will respect it. If I had a sale for chickweed, I think I'd be a goddamn millionaire. Keep out of fine. Which, you know, get back to the fun. science lab. And um, before I hand you over to Brendan, just one last question there. Um, if you were to give like a top tip to farmers where you would get advice and support, where, where has it been to date or where's a good place for farmers to look for advice and support, do you find? Uh, without a doubt, I think it's to be active. I know it's locked down now and actually with YouTube, you can find interesting ideas, but often uh, the biggest influences on me uh, since I started doing this profession around 15 years ago is to visit farms, just keep seeing what people are doing because the reality of it is never the same as reading about it. Uh, and you, you, you know, it's almost like looking into someone's eyes as they're express, telling you something, you can see if it's a good idea. Uh, yeah, and you see so much without getting explanations when you visit farms. And it's some things you might miss, like efficiencies, where to place, you know, watering barrels or watering systems in general. Like, why should we be watering with cans at all? You know, and some farmers are really good at setting it up or how they have their packing sheds laid out. They, people love to share what types of variety of plants they grow because they identify with the success of certain crops and you can learn a huge amount by getting on your bike and getting out there uh, and my impression so far has been they've been really willing to share uh, their ideas you know and their knowledge because essentially you have to be quite efficient as well as sensitive to your surrounds uh, and it's 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 a hard thing to learn without seeing setups, if you know what I mean. Someone that's actually doing it and how they're doing it. Uh, so yeah, if anyone's interested, I would advise that. Even chipping in for a, a day at a farm, you know, that kind of thing could be a, like reading a book almost. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, as uh, not one size fits all, so everyone's farm is so different that you kind of nearly do need to cherry pick loads of different ideas from all over the place as well. Um, I'll hand you over to Brendan there. Uh, just for anyone, um, if you have any questions for Patrick, please write it into the chat box there and we'll get around to as many of them as possible. And also, if you are in the crowd and you know the answer to any of the questions, feel free to um, like carry on the conversation in the chat box as well and give other people the answers. Okay. <clears throat> thanks, Bridget. And uh, thanks, Patrick. That's really interesting. Um, so yeah, um, just to say to everybody, I, I, I watched your video again there, Patrick, before I came on the call, and it's, it's really beautiful. It's, it's five minutes of just uh, a lovely, gentle introduction to, to Farming for Nature. So congr congratulations on that and on, on the work that you do. And I think it's also quite interesting to hear of your, 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 your own story in farming, even at 15 years, and you're learning all the time. And I think the point you make about you know, the reality versus the theory is, is, is really important. And I suppose with Farming for Nature, that's one thing we want to try and do is connect people with other people who have been been there and who can share their stories. And I think it's a, it's a rich vein. Um, there's a few questions coming in, Patrick, but uh, quite practical ones, but maybe just a few from myself before that. Um, first of all, I just quick mention about trees. How do you integrate trees into your landscape? Do you have many hedgerows? I know you have a beautiful orchard, um, but are, do trees feature a lot in terms of your farm and its management? Um, well, the biggest, like, yeah, I think the biggest impact trees would have on our uh, farm in terms of growing vegetable is that every year we, we collect the leaves off uh, an avenue that's really long. It's about, um, I'd say it's 
like a, it could be half a mile, you know, getting into this farm. It goes right from the road down to the end of the farm. And it's lined with ancient uh, beech trees and oak trees. Uh, and they're on a bank above the avenue. And every year they shed all their leaves. And we go with a chipper trailer and pick them all up. And we might collect 14 or 15 10 foot by six foot tipper traders. Uh, and those trees supply this leaf matter that we mix in with our um, farmyard manure because we have to get rid of it. Otherwise it blocks the drains in the avenue. Uh, and also we burn wood to heat our house and it's an old house and we have a quite a, a large burner and we use the um, ash from all that wood and that goes in the compost. And then we mix that up with the farmyard manure and, and uh, that is our fertility essentially. Uh, and it's, it's pretty good most of the time, you know, I've been pretty happy with, with the sort of low disease burden, with the fertility, you know, with the health of the soil, all the rest. Uh, so that's one application that the trees seem to provide us. Uh, around this farm, all the fields have trees around them. Uh, and they're, they're trees that are quite old. And there's a lot of areas where there's wildlife living thanks to the trees providing the habitat. Uh, and I'm pretty sure not just the hedgerows that we've planted that are established, but the, the bird life in particular that's in those trees is, is having an impact on the vegetable side of our production, uh, for sure. As well as that offering wind breaks and all the rest that trees can provide. Uh, because, you know, I mean, not, it's not always positive, by the way. There's, um, there's a bird called the pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> He's not so useful when you're growing brassicas and things. Yeah. yeah, you might have seen him around. Uh, so we have to net like quite large areas sometimes. But most of the time, uh, I think it's beneficial. So yeah, we've lost crops without netting, essentially. That's the key. There's not much else we need to do, not many preventative measures. Uh, yeah, and my plan now is to um, focus on uh, at least 20% of the farm is to plant it up in agroforestry systems. So I can keep grazing it until you know the trees may be developed such that there won't be as much of the field to be grazed. Uh, but I'm very interested in planting uh, native trees uh, in grassland, leaving space between them, either to harvest haylage or to graze it. Uh, that, that's something that I think is the next step for this farm is to give back a bit of that grassland uh, and get more trees going. Uh, because it, it just seems to be something that we should all be doing now. You know, I think there's, you can't really uh, give, give land a better use essentially than its, its natural state uh, and planting a few trees. And I'm not talking wilding initially because I feel uh, I, I need the income from the grassland to, to you know, to give back something. Uh, but I feel also that... Uh, it, it's something that's going to take some time and uh, it's, it's, it's the next idea I have. Super. Um, that's really interesting, um, the agroforestry and how, how it might be realized. Um, a quick question as well on your shorthorns. They sound, they sound wonderful. I love shorthorns. We, we have a few here in the barn as well, but what's your management yeah. regime? Do you run them in one herd? Um, when do you wean off the, 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 the younger calves? Um, do you house them, etc.? Well, the, yeah, we, we manage them in one herd for a start. And actually, just before anything, with the agroforestry, essentially, that could extend the amount of time I can leave them out before housing. Uh, that's one of the big interests I have, because I'm not t in tillage, so I'm importing straw. Uh, and the price of straw fluctuates greatly, and that can be the profit winner or loser, you know? Uh, and I'm talking between 12 euro delivered to 35 delivered. So it can double from one year to the next, uh, which you might not always expect. So yeah, if I can get the ground to take cattle out for longer, it'd be great. Yeah, I think uh, our management system is run them in a herd, we move them. We don't have small paddocks in this farm. The fields are between five acres to nine. That's just the way it was when I took it on. Uh, yeah, we leave them in the fields until, you know, they've eaten whatever. Like, basically, they might leave them in a four-acre field for three days and then move them on to another one. 
we tend to carry around 50 animals in total, ranging between the yeah, like 30 months down to seven months. And all the animals we have here, I, I have local uh, friends essentially that are farming shorthorn and I buy in their weanlings. Oh. So I'm not breeding them. We did breed uh, Angus for years here. And I, I realized that I'd, I'd prefer to put my energies into the vegetable aspect for the financial return at the time. And it just so happened that three people I know and they're top quality farmers essentially are breeding shorthorn in my locality. So that's how I got into shorthorn. Uh, and uh, yeah, I buy them in at six months and we house them in sheds and you know, it's all very basic, put the straw out by hand, uh, keep them in, in there from December to March uh, and then run them through the fields. And they just travel around the farm in a clockwise rotation. Uh, and yeah, I'm really, really interested to see if agroforestry can keep them out for another five to six weeks without poaching the land or damaging it in the long run, you know? Yeah, we we had a couple of really interesting uh, talks from Jane Shackleton last week and from Clive early previously, and I think both of them use agroforestry very effectively um, to extend their grazing season. So that's that's one to watch. Um, just two two other general questions mm -hmm. for me, Patrick. I'm I'm kind of interested in first of all, you know, the way we look at your farm from the video is that you're I mean you're delivering all these wonderful so-called ecosystem services and I think a whole social service in terms of the engagement with with the community visiting and otherwise but um you're kind of reliant largely on on the market do you get any um support in terms of agri-environmental schemes do you get sufficient would you like to see that playing a bigger role in future in terms of your farm economy uh yeah we do have support there's an organic farming scheme that we're part of we're part of glass also and if you are an organic farm uh, it's you get you know you, you just walk into the glass with very little to do essentially you know maybe pan hedgerows or you get accepted quicker uh, so you, there's good treatment essentially because you're doing things that they want you to do uh, low input permanent pastures things like that riverine fencing uh, things that we would be doing anyway uh, and there's the basic payment scheme. Now, not all these schemes would pay you hugely, but it certainly is a big boost to know every year that that's a security. Uh, and I'm really grateful for it. And when I started out in organic farming, there was 60% uh, funding for certain horticultural implements. And now, you know, there's, I haven't got too much involved in funding uh, because I realized I shouldn't invest too much and be careful of thinking ahead of myself, which can happen to in farming pretty quickly. Uh, so I, but I know there's supports for people starting out there. Uh, so, you know, excluding that 60% cover of the cost for certain implements to get into it is, is a big boost. Uh, should it be bigger? Um, I, I'd be careful of saying what it should be because you need to, you know, you got to be hungry in this game too to be you know i guess like careful of how you're farming you know and doing a good job and all the rest of it and sometimes getting you know unearned income through the door can sort of take the edge off you i'm not saying we shouldn't have it and like i can certainly see some years like last year was a very tough year for us uh because we couldn't get a lot of volunteers to come through uh and suddenly our profit margins were you know, we're getting to the point where we were wondering, is this going to make a profit this year for us or not? Uh, so overall, I think there, there is good support out there uh, and probably farmers are never happy <laughs> in some way like you know, there's always a problem. But I, I do feel very grateful also for the support I've had. Uh, and it, it certainly made it possible for me, you know, every year having a dependable uh, like income from the grants. Yeah, great. That's a, a very uh, good and positive answer, Patrick. The final question I have, and then we'll move on to the, 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 the rapid fire <laughs> response questions to the practical issues is that I know from speaking a lot of the other ambassadors, I mean, a lot of them really have a, a vocation for and love of farming. Um, a lot of them invest huge amounts of time and energy in, in what they do, but a lot of them have had to um, develop marketing skills and connections in order to make their system economically viable 
Um, so you need that added value to your product. How did you manage that yourself, Pat? Was it something that came natural? How did you build those connections and build those markets? Uh, this is really important for anyone getting involved because naturally I'm not very good at marketing. I'm quite shy when it comes to selling things initially anyway, or demanding a price for a product. I didn't feel comfortable uh, with raising prices, you know, even if costs were going up and things like that. Uh, and the way I developed was working with people on this farm. After a few years, I needed help. And I had a, you know, a full-time person here. Uh, they, they seemed to come and go. They might stay a year or two and then move on. And it was from watching them, it was a sort of remit, you know, go, go and see if we can find a salad customer. Go let's see, see if we can promote our product. I noticed that they were coming back with contacts uh, and they were going out and into restaurants more than I would have done, you know, just a different personality type. And I guess the advice I'd give someone is don't overthink it. Like if you have a product, you, obviously it should be labeled. The requirements are get your label on it, put on some nice clothes and just walk in somewhere. Show them what you're doing. Give them your price list. Like if you're, you know, you're going to be dependable. So if someone can sort of see that you're genuine, uh, they'll often be interested to work with you, especially if you're long term. Uh, and maybe don't overthink it beyond that. And then the key is to go back, see how they're getting on. Did they like it? Uh, you can WhatsApp them but, or whatever, ring them, but the, often it's best just to revisit. Uh, it's not being pushy or anything. It's just to make sure they've got the connection, the contact. And that's what I would advise people to do if you're dealing with uh, shops or restaurants, at least. So show the product, come back, see if they like it, keep in touch, you know? Because uh, now we can be hiding behind screens and texting. And sometimes you might miss out an opportunity to show your personality uh, if, you, if you don't, you know, stand up there and talk. Uh, also, I think... What helped us a lot was that um, we had a diversity of range so we could operate throughout the whole year and that interested uh, potential buyers. So there wasn't a wide, wide range, but it was enough to be feasible to grow it and to be interesting. Uh, and the last thing we tried to do was always fulfill an order. So someone asked us something like, could you grow this for us? We always tried to, to make an effort, you know? Uh, and then after a while you figure out what works and what doesn't. And you can let go to things that are, you know, taking too much time. But initially, I think giving that bit to a, to a customer means a lot. And it was genuine because we really wanted to be part of it, you know. And the excitement when it works out, it's, it's a real rush. Uh, but I felt, yeah, I was, I was slow going. I really was. I probably, if I knew what I know now, I would have been like where I was in my fourth year. I could have been at the end of my first year, you know. Uh, I did help being in a farmer's market uh, because people found me as well. Uh, I was every week and people eventually got to know the stall and restaurants became familiar with it. Uh, uh, so without doing a whole lot, just being present, being consistent. Uh, consistency is obviously key because when you're on a menu and you don't show up, it's a, you know, you're not going to make too many friends. Uh, but I noticed that uh, restaurants are really understanding if a crop fails, for example, or halfway through, there's a problem, you know, you might get uh, aphids on your broccoli or, you know, or something goes wrong. Uh, they often understand exactly that it isn't a perfect guaranteed system every time. So I wouldn't say, like, be careful of engaging with sales because, you know, they will understand you're doing your best. Uh, also this year, uh, I joined in a program it's called MOPS with the IOA, the Irish Organic Association, funded by the European Initiative Program. And MOPS is maximizing organic production systems. And it was set up uh, uh, by Gillian, who runs the IOA. And essentially, it brought together organic farmers of small or big scale, and it encouraged them to share their growing practices uh, it provided scientists to analyze their soils and techniques and to share information, including marketing. So my advice is, is that too, connect with farmers. I was lucky because I got into this group that was structured and had a, a real end goal, which was to like improve Irish organic production systems for the Irish customer, because uh, there's a good market here in Ireland. But even if you're not, you can set up one, keep in touch with friends, you know, set up groups on social media, 
uh, and there's some really interesting, like for example, you can someone can send you a text saying there's a great biodegradable packaging here. Let's all go in on it, you know, and then you can provide the customer with something that will appeal to them and feel ethically you're packaging your vegetables more sustainably. Or yeah, how to be efficient in growing cultivars. You can share information which will help your marketing if you've got something that tastes great and is reliable. Uh, and for us, MOPS has been really a big eye opener just to what else is going out there and educationally on this farm, it's been really positive. That's brilliant, um, Patrick. So MOPS, M-O-P-S, so anybody might look that up, Google that later on, it's very useful. Now I've got a bunch of questions for, me, for you. So let's, let's fly on with them. Um, on practical issues. So first of all, from Claire Lyons, um, talking about your cattle, do you feed them on more than grass, like herbal mixed lays? So I, I guess that's a question of like, what's your grassland like? Is it old grassland? Is it kind of newly reseeded or what, what is it like, Patrick? Uh, mostly old, actually. Uh, we haven't done a whole lot to our grassland in, in let's say 60% of this farm. Uh, and it's got things like timothy and rye in it and white clover. Uh, one, one area of the farm we did reseed and the clover growth in the farm was phenomenal in that side of the farm. Um, white clover again, uh, and that was rye and timothy. Uh, our, our lays, we, I, top, I dist harrowed a few fields and, and tried to um, stitch in clover to get a, you know, a bit more of that in, in the in the sward, I'm really interested in, in improving the nitrogen in the ground without it costing me much. Uh, the results were quite mixed for the cost. It wasn't hugely expensive, but time and effort. Uh, I, I think from the way we manage our sward, that it's essentially we, we graze it quite tightly. We keep the weeds out of it. It's very clean grassland, essentially. There's very little weed growth. Uh, we'll top it when it's permitted by the, the glass scheme we're in. Uh, and we do regular soil testing for the pH in lime if necessary. Uh, liming is something that we all know we should do, but it seems to be, it's not one of the sexy things, you know. <laughs> you might leave it, but here I've, I've seen the benefits of it uh, for sure. And then lastly, it's trying to keep the, the land protected for the winter. So we tend not to let it get poached at all. We give it, you know, around November time, we're thinking of bringing in the heavier ones, mid-November onwards uh, and leave it, leave it time to sit over the winter because it gets quite wet, uh, even though it's sandy loam soil. Uh, I'm, I'm quite surprised how much water can lodge in it. Uh, in a few years, we've let them out a bit too late and the recovery was slow for the spring, you know? Uh, so it's paying off keeping them in the shed and putting the straw in, I feel. Great. Um, so Caroline Conley had a question about the short horns you buy them in as, 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 as young calves, as weanlings from, from your neighbours. Um, Dan McCarthy has a question. Is the compost covered outside when, when, you're, turn, when you're turning it? Uh, the answer is it, it should be. Uh, this year we didn't cover it because uh, my, I took away my cover and used it elsewhere on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> or I needed it. Uh, but yeah, definitely, like, it, it's so important to think of compost as uh, something that's breathing, because anywhere air is flowing, uh, there's microbiological activity. And one thing Ireland has is heavy precipitation, uh, and that would lodge in the compost. And I see it now in mine, you know, it's, it's really this, I, I stack it up quite high because I have a digger, so I can keep it, like, you know, off the ground. When the piles are in their sort of initial state there could be six or eight feet high and I've turned it and then sort of shaped it into a long high windrow. Uh, uh, if it's covered the water isn't allowed to permeate right through and clog it all up uh, and you'll notice if you do cover it uh, you get a sort of crumbler, crum crumblier browner compost whereas if the rain's let in it tends to be sort of less decomposed and blacker and not as crumbly. Uh, so yeah definitely cover it. The only thing to watch out for is that it can heat a lot. So you have to be careful what you, I've covered it with cat, with um, tarpaulins that I bought in hardware stores and they actually just melted or burned off patches in them, which was quite an expensive lesson. Uh, so 
there is special covers that you can find that can take temperature. Uh, but yeah, I couldn't stress that more. It should be covered. And then potentially uh, find, like walk around in the winter time and see where your uh, land is driest. That's convenient because you can place that in one, you know, you could find you've got lots of problems dealing with it when it's wet areas around it, not even for the compost itself. You can dig up the ground too much. Brilliant. Um, another question from Claire, and I'll paraphrase it. It's, it's about these uh, floral strips, um, uh, Patrick. What what do you do when they finish flowering? Do you do you, do you till till them back into the ground? Do you grow something else in their place? Um, how do you manage those strips once they're finished flowering for the year? Uh, well, the idea of the flowering strip, floral strips is that they will be in situ for nearly the entire growing season. So in them uh, we have corn flowers. We might have three successional plantings of them. Uh, we'll have a lot of calendula and we put in nasturtiums. Uh, so until like the third week of October, hopefully there's, there's plants in place, uh, even with flowers to harvest. Uh, what we do then is we just top the strip. We'll essentially just chop it up uh, and then we spread compost over it. We have a, a small JF rear muck spreader and we'll cover it. Uh, so that ground will just be left covered for the year. Like we'll, we'll cover it with uh, like a sheet of polythene or cardboard or something. Uh, another option is to, if you just, yeah, I guess you could do it at the end of September, early October. You, we have done it before is discarded uh, manure and then put in rye, uh, cereal rye. And it's phenomenal how quickly that can come up and how sort of, uh, boosting it is to see the vigor of cereal rye and it will stand beautifully over the winter and it incorporates effortlessly with a bit of disc harrowing. I mean you're only disc harrowing the surface it's not a more than a few inches. Uh, yeah so that would that'd be the two ways. And um, Just a final question for me before I go back to Bridget for, for the green manures um, Patrick like the facility and stuff like that how do you how do you integrate those when they're finished um, their main growing period? Uh, I think I, there's two ways you can do it. Uh, Phacelia and especially the buckwheat, uh, both of them are quite tall growing plants and they're dense. Uh, my preferred way is to disc harrow it again, maybe knock it back almost. It's like a rolling of it, lay it out in the ground and it will sort of stand up a little bit and, it will, and then I'll wait a week and knock it back another way and it will slowly be melting away and breaking down into the ground. And I'm more crushing it than miscellating it into the topsoil. It's just been uh, broken up. The fibers have been broken up. They're quite soft plants. You know, they don't take much knocking to, to melt away. Uh, other times I've topped it I've, on quite high revs and just mulched it straight in. And, uh, you know, as you sort of leave it, you've got it like a half inch or an inch covering on the ground of shredded plant material. Uh, you could use a mulcher as well, you know, I mean, we just have a topper, so that's what I use. Uh, what I love about those two is that they grow so fast and they're so vigorous and they die back so easily that they take up this little space of time in the growing season where we might always, you know, where we might find, you know, somewhere between August and September. At times you can have crops that were out in the spring, and they're ready, they've been harvested and you just want to do something for two months and then over winter with cereal rye. And the uh, Facelia is phenomenal. It's a phenomenal plant for bees. It really is. Uh, it never ceases to impress me. And it's a beautiful cut flower and it stores very well once it's picked. Uh, so that's how I manage them. Great. Thanks very much, Patrick. Um, so on to the next question. Uh, Robert Clusen has asked, Are the, do you have set cover crops as part of your rotation? Uh, Set cover crops. Like I a think, sequence as such. Uh, not, no, no, even like the whole rotation for us, it, it's such a difficult thing to, to jumble up because we don't have equal portions of the different families. You know, if it's alliums or brassicas or solanaceae outside, uh, we, you know, rotation is never going to be 100% kept with us. It's just not feasible. What I tend to do with the cover crops and green manures is when a piece of land is free, I'll put it in. I'll sort of react to how the season has gone. Like sometimes a crop might fail, for example, uh, or a crops are a few weeks earlier. 
uh, but I don't have a huge range of cover crops as such. I think the ones I've mentioned I've found are found either they germinate and are vigorous, so I just stick with them. I don't know if mine's frozen or yours is frozen, Patrick. I think it's Patrick. Okay. Okay, we can hear you there. So your um, your broadband. So yeah, you were just talking about maybe it's the next phase of uh, of what you've been doing in terms of education wise, uh, moving into agritourism. Yeah, I th well, well, I think that like a lot of the things I'm interested in, it's the impact it has on me and the people around me. Uh, and you know, it's it's up and it's down like life. You know, you can't be happy all the time, even though we're told you should be. And uh, where I'm at it, with the farm now is a point where I've, it's actually empty at the moment. I have no one helping me here. There's one woofer who's going next week and no, no more coming. And there's no employees here at the moment uh, since December. And I'm, I'm thinking of what route to take. And I think agro-tourism, I like the seasonality of, of it for a start. It could be a summer activity on this farm. It could be fun to share it in a different way. Uh, and then the meaningful impact, you know, I could offer or people could offer to me uh, interests me. And education is, is something that offers itself well to farming because often you don't have to talk a lot. You, you just show what you've done or you explain what you are doing. It's, uh, it's quite a physical form of expression to teach, you know, this type of thing. Uh, which is why I was attracted to it initially. It was really diverse. Often, if you're you're gonna, you know, you can you can actually learning how to weld was really useful <laughs> to farming for me or electrical plumbing, you know, for irrigation. Uh, yeah, and I think um, I would be really interested to um, to give back a little bit on this farm and maybe incorporate it as much of that diversity in education as I could uh, and see what, how it goes. I know for sure there, there is interest and there's potential in it. So the person who asked that question, I, I would say it's, it's certainly worth exploring. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely taken off in other countries, isn't it? Like people wanting to go onto farms. And I, I even see with us in our farm walks, there's a massive, massive interest. Like they, they sell out really fast, both from farmers, but also from other interested parties. Um, so just because we're coming to the end of our session, um, I suppose the one of the questions I have to, for you, Patrick, is what's probably your own favourite win-win that you did for nature on your farm? What do you feel that you did that you're now reaping the benefits from maybe commercially, but also that for nature, it's just, it's worked massively. Um, it's, I'd say one of them is the nature of the work I did on this farm was quite focused. And a lot of the farm was not interacted with, or I, I left it out of my scheme. You know, there's sort of woodlands and the riverine areas and the, might sound a little bit counterintuitive when you're talking about farming, but it was what I didn't do in some places that I might have done. I think we can often get ideas, oh, we should become this or that. Uh, so I let nature be nature in certain aspects of this farm. Uh, and I love going to those places and you can see the diversity. If there's adjoining lands, which we have with our neighbors, the, the benefit of it in terms of wildlife, in terms of plant diversity and all the rest. So that's something I would, I would say is worth thinking about. Like, what can I do and what should I leave well alone? Uh, other aspects of like, you know, I guess from incorporating farmyard manure and compost into the ground on a the microbiological level, I think uh, certain benefits have been seen in, in nature, but it's might be not visible to the naked eye because uh, we've spread farmyard manure on the grassland uh, as our only source of fertility and on the vegetable area in higher amounts. And uh, I think there, there, there is obviously results that it's obviously working. Uh, and I'm sure the diversity of activity and what's going on at the biological level is something that is uh, improved upon. Uh, you know, and that, that really is the, the machinery that we don't see that's doing lots of the work. Uh, and something I've 
enjoyed uh, learning a little bit about. Uh, we, we had a soil biologist stay with us and with microscopes for three or four days. We were analyzing the soil and, you know, seeing all these little things wheeling their way around with cilia or flagella and other, you know, bacteria, how they function, coalesce with roots, systems and share nutrients. Uh, the synergy and symbiosis of that, I think, is, is, is what drives what's on top of the soil. Uh, so yeah, and a lot of that was just by composting farmyard manure and spreading it. Mm. Uh, yeah, probably those two things. It's lovely to be amongst a kind of a real living, living landscape as well, you know, it's kind of, it's, there's something very, like, nurturing for a person around that. And um, there's been a few comments here, one Jim Cronin, your former uh, teacher has just said he's listening to you, listening to you here now with Rebecca and uh, uh, another lady, Linda Gleeselin, has written that she loves that answer. Um, Patrick, I just want to finish up really with uh, if you had a top tip for every farmer in Ireland, uh, conventional or non-conventional, of something that they could do on their farm, what would it be? What would your top tip be for nature? Top tip. Uh, it's, well, it's, it's not really, yeah, I actually, I feel this like, what I've come to realize and the way I've been working here or interacting with nature is uh, like, how are you feeling about what you're doing? Because often what we do impacts us and defines us. Uh, and like, yeah, like for example, not my top tip, but like from my experience with, um, people coming through on this farm uh, and their worries for nature. It's been, yeah, like I said, to be more aware in myself. What are you doing? What impacts are you having? Often you make a decision because it has an economic return. So any farmer is sitting there drawing up plans. Uh, you know, I'm not saying we're all avaricious, you know, money grabbers, but we'll often think of something that we can improve our a financial situation with that could have a short-term game and a long-term negative impact. So when I say about leaving areas of the farm alone, uh, I realize not every farm has that potential if it's a small area, but even little areas, I would advise like, you know, like micro wilding, give like pockets of nature a chance around your farm, like be conscious of how you're impacting your surrounds. Because if we all did it, you know, there could be enough continuity to sort of improve the fragmentation of habitats. If you look across some areas of Ireland now, there's what you could consider a dairy prairie where there's just grassland and nothing else is really allowed to go and the hedgerows might be less and all the rest. And uh, yeah, I would encourage, I mean, I'm certainly interested now in planting more perennials, planting like pockets of woodland. They don't have to be that large agroforestry and things that will remain uh, and after, not just annual projects, you know? So that would be my advice, I think. Think more long-term about how the land will, will be formed by your activity. That's a really nice answer. You know, it's lovely to have people like yourself who are speaking so well and kind of on the side of nature. And thank you so much for lending us your expertise and your knowledge. I mean, your 15 years have stood well to you. and. Uh, but um, if people wanted to contact your farm directly or anything, where do they find it on social media and stuff? Uh, Kilbrack Organic, isn't it? Uh, yeah, Kilbrack Farm is on uh, Facebook. Uh, and my, um, my email address is there. That's probably the best is email address, paddyfrankel at gmail.com. And uh, just uh, from a personal note, I'd just like to reach out and extend the a big hello and thank you to Jim Cronin who's joined because uh, I think for a lot of people he's been the catalyst you know he's a very inspirational person very knowledgeable and very dynamic and Jim and Rebecca have had a big influence on my life uh, and I did his course uh, in a time where I was floating about a bit and it it's it focused me you know and gave mm -hmm. me uh, an immensely uh, enjoyable career up to this point whichever way it goes from here so I think it's important to acknowledge my teacher in that respect. Yeah, it's really nice that uh, his, his, he seems to have spread his wings. A lot of people that we come across have, have trained on the gym and, and stuff. 
Um, if anyone hasn't seen Patrick Frank uh, Frankel's uh, video, I mentioned it earlier, it's on our YouTube channel, so do check it out. And this recording of this in its bits and bobs and bits that we missed and stuff will also be up on YouTube. So, you know, it's really nice if you know someone who wants to listen to tonight's session, they might be in a car or a tractor, they can just listen to it as they're driving along um, to tonight's Q&A session and feel free to share it on your social media. Hopefully, um, maybe COVID allowing, we might have a walk on Patrick's farm, a farm or a farming for nature farm walk on Patrick's farm, maybe later in the summer or something. So keep an eye out for that. If Patrick allows us to come and join him on the farm, that would be great. Um, and if you have any questions that you feel weren't answered tonight and would like them answered, we also have a forum online on our website, farmingfornature.ie. So go there and lots of farmers uh, respond uh, and can answer your questions. So next week we have tillage farmer Andrew Bergen um, from County Kildare. So please join us and sign up as usual through our website. Patrick, thank you so much again. Really inspirational what you've kind of achieved. And I love the idea that you're, you know, you're always changing, you're always bringing in new ideas, but even like you're very honest about where you're going from here, you know, that you're starting to adapt to. And I think that's really important with farming and the environment and, and nature is changing the whole time as well. But like that what you're doing on your farm is responding to how your own personal nature is changing. And, and that's really important. And I think both from an economical, environmental, and obviously our cultural point of view. Um, Brendan, is there anything you'd like to add there? You well, to yeah, not at all, just to say thanks, Patrick. Absolutely fascinating. And like all of these stories, uh, your story of the land and with the land and, and it's an evolving story, I, I just find it fascinating. And I think inspiring um, what you do and how you do it and more power to you and um, best to look in, in the years ahead. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you again next week. Goodbye. Thanks, Bridget.